good uh, morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are today. Um, thank you for being here with us today. We are right at the top of the hour um, and to be respectful of your time, let's get started. Um, so we're, we're again glad you're here today and really appreciate the time that you've taken to attend this industry update webinar to learn more about Harmony Biosciences. And if you haven't heard the news yet, our DM1 phase two trial that we opened earlier this year. I am Kelly Wright and I am part of our patient advocacy team here at Harmony. Um, and a big thanks to everyone who submitted questions with your registration. We'll try to answer those throughout the presentation, um, but we do have a Q&A at the end. And so if you have questions that aren't answered um, or any that you think of, please enter in the Q&A button, um, probably at the bottom of your screen, but might be at the top. Um, and if we don't get to your question, um, we'll show you an email address at the end of the presentation that um, please feel free to uh, email your questions um, to learn more. So Harmony Biosciences was established in 2017 with a vision to develop and commercialize novel treatment options for people living with rare diseases. We are committed to understanding the needs and perspectives of people living with and families impacted by rare neurological diseases, including myotonic dystrophy. Patients are at the heart of everything that we do here at Harmony, and we're excited to support the myotonic dystrophy community. At Harmony, we take our core values very seriously. As a patient advocacy team, my colleague Rachel and I work with patient advocacy organizations at the national and local level, and very much enjoy working with disease-specific organizations like the Muscular Dystrophy Association. We financially support the communities we serve through meeting sponsorships, education and resource, resource, resources support, and other advocacy funding programs. And most important to us is to ensure that we're bringing the patient voice into every department at Harmony. Listening to patients and their caregivers is critical as we think about joining a disease community. When looking at past efforts to listen to people living with myotonic dystrophy and find shared symptoms in their lives, we looked to the Christopher Project, the FDA's patient-focused drug development meeting, and a Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation annual conference session. As you can see from some of the quotes here, all of these important reports and meetings pointed to a common theme. Many people living with myotonic dystrophy reported experiencing excessive daytime sleepiness, EDS, fatigue, and or cognitive dysfunction. Earlier this year, Harmony was honored to host a patient and caregiver advisory board with six advisors who shared their daily lives, their struggles, and their fears of living with myotonic dystrophy. Members of the Harmony clinical, medical, and patient advocacy teams were engaged during this two-day meeting. And during that time, advisors confirmed that while other symptoms of their disease were important, they were not as disruptive to their daily lives as the sleepiness, fatigue, and cognitive dysfunction. Overall, advisors shared what a significant burden these secondary symptoms are on the health quality of their lives and that they're not well managed with the available treatment options. So based on the surveys, meetings, reports, and our own discussions with patient adv and advocacy groups, we've heard that there's a strong desire by the myotonic dystrophy community to address these needs through new treatment options, and Harmony is excited at the possibility of contributing positively to the lives of people living with myotonic dystrophy. And now I am happy to turn it over to my colleague, Bill Jacobson, um, who works on our clinical development for this trial, who will share more about sleep, myotonic dystrophy, and our open DM1 trial. Bill? Thank you, Kelly, and uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone who's joining. Um, it is really a pleasure and a privilege to be able to talk with you a little bit about our plans for um, looking at sleep and excessive daytime sleepiness in type one myotonic dystrophy. Um, uh, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, the general issue we're approaching and then I'll get into the details of the study that is actually underway um, and provide you with some information about what we're doing and how to participate should you be interested. Can I have the next slide please, Kelly? 
So a little bit about why we're looking at sleep and myotonic dystrophy. Um, in the first instance, while <clears throat> myotonic dystrophy is in fact a muscular dystrophy, and it is actually the most common muscular dystrophy in adults, um, it is really a multi-systemic disease, and it has impact on many systems in the body. It impacts uh, not only the muscles, but it certainly impacts the heart, the endocrine system, um, eyes, um, and to a very large extent, the brain. And we're going to be focusing um, on non-neuromuscular aspects of muscular dystrophy. Um, what I do want to talk to you uh, a little bit, though, about initially is sleep and um, what's going on with sleep and myotonic dystrophy. So as you're all aware, I'm sure sleep and wakefulness um, are, are important and naturally occurring phenomena. Um, interestingly, they're controlled by different systems in the brain. Um, there are many different disturbances of sleep or wakefulness, and they have a, a lot of impact on health and functioning and activities of daily living. Um, one of the things that we find, and I'll show you some data in a moment, is that myotonic dystrophy is characterized by a lot of excessive daytime sleepiness. Um, and not only is the sleepiness very common, but it's also extremely impactful. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, both sleep and wakefulness are controlled within the brain by chemicals called neurotransmitters. And the drug that we're investigating has significant impact on some of these neurotransmitters. I'm not gonna get too much into the chemistry, certainly if anyone is interested and wants to follow up, I'd be happy to provide them with information. What we are in fact interested in though, however, and what we're looking at in this study particularly, is how we can beneficially impact excessive daytime sleepiness, fatigue, which is actually different from sleepiness, cognitive function, and the overall burden of disease on patients with myotonic dystrophy type one. Um, <clears throat> in the questions that we received, a number of people have asked about DM2, type two myotonic dystrophy. Um, the study that we are undertaking is restricted to patients with type one myotonic dystrophy. Um, and the reason for that is that DM1 and DM2, while they have many similarities, are in fact different diseases. Um, and it's important for us to understand, to focus on DM1 um, and learn uh, what kind of impact or beneficial impact we may have on the disorder. And certainly should we be able to demonstrate uh, a benefit in DM1, we would consider extending our studies to the DM2 population as well. Next slide, please, Kelly. So th this is some data from a study called the PRISM-1 study that was undertaken by uh, Chad Heatwall and his group uh, at the University of Rochester Medical Center. And they looked at uh, a large group of patients with myotonic dystrophy with type 1. They actually repeated this study uh, in, as the PRISM-2 study in uh, type, type 2 myotonic dystrophy, but we're focusing on type 1 here. And you can see a number of uh, symptoms and signs that patients with the disorder have reported. Um, and not only do we look at how common these are, and you could see that there's a very high prevalence of non-neuromuscular symptoms. Uh, excessive daytime sleepiness is approaching 90%. Fatigue is roughly 90%. And, and some cognitive issues, difficulties thinking, and, and this is a complex area that, that people often refer to as a brain fog fully impact half of the patients who were, um, who were queried. Not only are, are these non-neuromuscular symptoms very prevalent, very common, but they have a lot of impact. Um, th these are, are, are symptoms that, that really do impact patients. Um, and uh, you can see that the degree of impact of excessive daytime sleepiness and fatigue is as high or higher than some of the muscular symptoms that we see, such as myotonia, um, uh, you know, suggesting that, that sleepiness and, and related symptoms really do impact quality of life um, to a degree that is, is surprisingly um, as impactful, it seems, as some of the more common muscular symptoms um, that we typically see. Next slide, please, Kelly. So we can just move on to the next one. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, the study that we're undertaking. Again, this is restricted to DM1 patients because of the, uh, the, the, the difference in, in the um, 
uh, cause uh, and, and the physiology and the, the genetic characteristics of the disorder. So as I mentioned, should uh, we be able to demonstrate uh, a beneficial effect in this study, um, we would certainly consider looking at DM2. Now, in, um, in, in any uh, clinical study, um, you know, we have to have an objective. And our primary objective here is to evaluate the safety, and that always comes first, as well as the efficacy of, of a drug called pitolescent, comparing it to placebo, a, 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 uh, an in inactive drug, so sometimes referred to as a sugar pill, um, in the treatment of excessive daytime sleepiness in patients with type 1 myotonic dystrophy aged 18 to 65. So this study is actually restricted to adult patients. Um, the drug, while it is approved for certain indications, such as narcolepsy, um, in both the US and Europe, um, is not approved for use in children. So we're restricting our study population to adults. Um, so that's our objective. Uh, in order to achieve the objective, we have to have an endpoint, something that we measure. And in this case, what we're looking at um, is we're using a special test called the maintenance of wakefulness test, which is a sleep study that is performed to see um, how long one can stay awake. Uh, many sleep tests look at how quickly you fall asleep. In this case, we're looking at the opposite end of, of things. It's how long you can stay awake. So what we're going to be doing is measuring the sleep latency, in other words, the time until you fall asleep. Um, and we're going to be comparing that from the beginning of the study, when you have no drug on board until the end, and compare that in patients taking the drug to those patients who are uh, taking a, an inactive drug or the placebo. Next slide, please, Kelly. So in addition to our primary, our main objective, you know, we're also evaluating a number of secondary endpoints that are very important. Um, so we'll be looking at the effect of our drug patolosant on other critical non-neuromuscular symptoms of type 1 myotonic dystrophy. Um, these include fatigue, and I want to stress that fatigue is different from sleepiness. It's a, it's a, a sense of tiredness, but you don't have that drive to fall asleep. And many of us can experience this both physically and mentally. We will also be looking at cognitive function. Uh, some of the elements, as I mentioned, of what is referred to as brain fog. So specifically what we're gonna be looking at is psychomotor functioning and the speed of processing, basically how, how quickly your, your brain can react and how quickly you can think. We'll be doing measures of attention and measures of working memory. And these are areas that are often reported as being problematic in patients um, with a disorder. Um, we're also gonna be looking at the clinician's assessment of the severity of sleepiness, as well as the patient's severity. It's very important, not only that we can demonstrate in a test such as the MWT or any of our cognitive measurements or something, a, a, a statistically significant beneficial change, but the change also has to be relevant to the patients. They have to perceive benefit. And lastly, we're gonna be looking at the overall burden of disease using an instrument that examines 17 different areas um, uh, to see uh, how impactful the disease is and whether we can beneficially impact that. So next slide, please, Kelly. So this is a trial design. It's a fairly simple design. We're looking at randomizing or entering 135 patients. This is a double blind study, so we will not know um, who has been assigned to what drug during the course of the study. Um, neither will the patients and neither will the physicians. So it's completely blinded. The way the study works is there's a screening period during which your eligibility um, for the study is assessed. If you are eligible and you're randomized to, uh, to a blinded treatment, there's a three-week titration period where people who are on the active drug will actually have their um, dosage increased over the three-week period. Uh, patients will end up in one of three groups. Uh, there'll be the placebo group that's not receiving any active drug, a low-dose group, and a high-dose group. Um, those patients will remain on that dose, whatever it is, for eight weeks. And that's the active double blind period uh, following which they'll be evaluated for all of the endpoints that I mentioned. Very importantly, and I'll discuss this more in a moment, 
um, patients who are, who, who are eligible um, will then be able to enter an open label extension study during which they will all receive um, active, active drug. So even if a patient is on placebo and does not perceive any benefit, they will have the opportunity, should they so choose, to enter the open label extension, which will last for at least a year, um, and receive drug during that time. Um, we do this for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons, obviously, is to provide medication to, to, to patients, but it also allows us to study longer-term safety information um, and collect that and report that to the regulatory agencies as we are required to do. Um, so the next slide, please, Kelly. Um, uh, and here I'm going to talk a little bit about the eligibility criteria. Who is able to actually enter the study? So next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, again, as I mentioned, this is a study in adults, so 18 to 65 years old, because the drug is not approved for use in children at this time. Um, we will be doing genetic testing to confirm that you actually have the genetic signature of type 1 myotonic dystrophy. Um, and we'll be asking the clinicians to do an overall impression of their assessment um, uh, of the sleepiness of, of the patient um, at the time of screening. Um, we will, uh, if patients, um, you know, are, are sleepy enough, uh, be doing the um, MWT test as I described previously. Um, and uh, you, you need to be able to stay awake for at least 25 minutes to be eligible for, to be randomized in the study. Now, a lot of patients who suffer from excessive daytime sleepiness are using some kind of wake-promoting agent. There are many that are available, ProVigil, NuVigil, which are modafinil and armodafinil, and, and a number of other drugs. Um, however, if you are taking one of these wake-promoting agents but still have residual excessive daytime sleepiness or the drug has not been effective for you, you are able to continue to enter the study and to continue on that wake-promoting drug with certain provisions. You need to have been on a stable dose for two months prior to screening and agree to remain on that dose through the entire double blind period. Um, so some patients may actually be taking a wake promoting agent in addition to the investigational product, whether that is placebo or active drug. Uh, again, we're looking for patients who are able to walk independently with or without an assistive device. So a cane, a walker, a brace, they're all fine. Um, if you are restricted to a wheelchair, um, you will not be eligible. Um, as is the case with investigational medications, appropriate contraceptive precautions for women who are of childbearing um, capacity. Um, and in the opinion of the investigator, um, the patient is, is capable of understanding and following the protocol and the administration of, of our study drug. Um, next slide, please. We'll actually discuss some of the um, uh, exclusion criteria. Um, so, you know, there are a number of things that can contribute to excessive daytime sleepiness. And we want to ensure that the excessive daytime sleepiness that we're seeing is in fact due to the disorder itself, to the myotonic dystrophy. So um, we're going to ask patients to do a one week sleep diary to ensure that their sleepiness is not due to sleep deprivation. Um, Many patients with um, myotonic dystrophy have some kind of sleep-related breathing disorder, obstructive sleep apnea or, or central sleep apnea. We just want the clinician, the investigator, to ensure that um, you know, your history of sleep-related breathing disorder um, or any other underlying sleep disorder um, is not a primary contributing factor to your excessive daytime sleepiness. So many of you will be using something like a CPAP or a BiPAP or, or a dental device, um, and that's fine as long as the investigator feels that the underlying uh, breathing disorder is not the primary contributor. Um, obviously, we don't want patients who have taken part in an investigational study recently um, we don't allow the use of certain medications that would interfere with the action of patolescent. Um, we do allow occasional use of sleep promoting agents of, of, of hypnotics or sleeping pills, um, but they're restricted to no more than twice a week and, and, and not before um, a study visit. And, and again, um, any patient who in the opinion of the investigator is similar to, to on the previous slide, but uh, in this case, looking at the other 
uh, direction. Any patient who, based on the judgment of the investigator, is unsuitable for the study for, for any reason. There are also a number of standard clinical trial exclusions, um, uh, some level of inadequate uh, kidney disease, uh, liver disease, um, patients who are nursing or planning to breastfeed, um, excessive caffeine intake, you know, um, which is a weight promoting agent, use of prohibited medications. Um, we do assess suicidality as we do in, in any clinical trial um, related to the central nervous system and so on. There are a number of other exclusion criteria, but, but these are the primary ones that I'd like to make you um, aware of. Um, so can I have the next one, please, Kelly? Now, um, there are there there is in the myotonic dystrophy population a relatively high incidence of cardiovascular disease. Um, many people living with myotonic dystrophy have implanted devices that manage their conditions. Um, many of these are allowed in the study. We do have fairly um, well defined uh, cardiovascular exclusion criteria. Um, we're allowing these implanted devices if they are designed really to prevent certain cardiovascular um, disorders. Um, implanted devices that are implanted to treat serious heart disease are not allowed. So there are certain heart disease not allowed in the study. Um, before you enter into the study, we will monitor you carefully with a Holter monitor, which is a type of portable EKG that records your heart rhythm over a 24-hour period while you're just doing your daily activities. Um, I do want to stress that we're being very careful, both in terms of enrolling patients to ensure that um, uh, we're not enrolling patients who are at higher risk of developing significant cardiovascular problems. Um, and we're also monitoring them throughout the study. The reason we do this is because we cannot always tell if a heart problem is caused by the drug or not. So again, we do this by careful screening to bring in the right patients and careful monitoring during the study itself. Um, next slide, please. So um, these are the sites that we have actually um, included in the study. You can see that they're well distributed. Um, we're also going to be opening a couple of sites in Canada where um, because of genetic reasons, there are some areas where there's an extremely high prevalence of myotonic dystrophy type one. Um, what I'd like to point out to you and stress is that if you are located in an area that's not close to any of these sites, but you are interested in participating and you are eligible to participate, um, we have a concierge service that will take care of things for you and get you to a site. So for instance, if you're located in Boise, Idaho, where you can see we clearly don't have um, any sites, you know, we can transport you to our site in, Spo in Seattle, Washington, for instance, uh, or in Denver. So um, the fact that you are not located where a site is should not be a concern. Um, uh, and if you are interested and eligible, I just want to stress that we will be taking care of getting you to the sites for your visits um, at no cost at all to you. Um, next slide, please, Kelly. Um, so following, as I've mentioned, following the eight-week double-blind period, um, you will be eligible to enter into an open label study. Um, you know, clinical trials are an essential part of the development of new treatments. And right now, there are no approved treatments for myotonic dystrophy or, or any of the signs or symptoms that accompany it. Um, having volunteers in clinical trials is, is critical. Uh, you know, every new medication and treatment starts with volunteers participating in our trial. Um, at the end of the double blind period, as I've mentioned, participants will be able to enter into our long-term open label safety extension um, that will allow us to continue to collect information. If you meet the criteria for that part of the trial and you choose to continue, um, you will receive open label indication at, a, at an appropriate dose. Um, and since the drug would still be considered investigational, you'll have periodic check-ins with the trial site to collect information. Um, these may be telephone visits and they may be um, on-site visits. Um, next slide, please, Kelly. 
So following this um, webinar, you will, all of those of you who are registered will receive uh, an email and included in that email will be an infographic with more information on the study itself um, and information on, on how to get uh, uh, additional information. Um, and if you are interested uh, in participating in the study, that will be covered as well. Next slide, please. So before turning things over, Kelly, I, I want to stress that Kelly will provide you with uh, information about the trial and participation. Um, in addition, uh, for those of you, one of the questions that was asked is how can we make our, our own physicians aware of the study? So they can use the same contact information and be provided with more detailed information on eligibility procedures and so on. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, and I will turn things back over to Kelly, who will uh, provide you with a little bit more information on, on how to learn more about the study um, and uh, wrap things up. So again, thank you very much. Kelly? Thank you, Bill, for that great overview. Uh, we are gonna see what questions have come through during the presentation. And to be more conversational, I'm gonna take the slides down. Uh, but before I do, um, if you do have any questions that were not answered today, um, do um, email this email address on the slide. It's clinicaltrials at harmonybiosciences.com, which is a long one. So it's C-L-I-N-I-C-A-L, T-R-I-A-L-S at Harmony, H-A-R-M-O-N-Y, Biosciences, B-I-O-S-C-I-E-S-E-N-C-E-S dot -E -E com. Um, I'm also going to send it in the chat um, so that you have that um, available to you as well. Um, and so let me stop sharing screen. Um, and ask you, Bill. So, um, you know, the, the clinical trials um, at, at harmonybiosciences.com will be a great place for you um, to ask really specific questions that you might have. There were a lot of questions that came in that were um, really, really specific. And that's exactly what for that email address is. And you'll get a Harmony um, employee to have a conversation with you about it. Um, and so there is a question that came in, Bill, that um, my, I don't know. I don't know if it's an, an answer now or, or a recommend to email um, clinical trials. But um, they asked when during the exclusion criteria slide of what about antidepressants? Um, I heard those can also preclude participation. Well, that's an excellent question, and certainly um, as is the case with many chronic diseases, many patients suffer from mild depression. Um, just as a consequence of the, the stress and so on and the impact of the disorder. So we are actually allowing low-dose antidepressants in the study. Um, there are certain antidepressants that would be excluded, and the reason for that is because of the way they are metabolized, the way the body breaks them down and uses them, can interfere with the um, metabolism of patolisant, the drug that we are looking at. However, there are a number, a large number of antidepressants that are permissible. So um, certainly this is something that will be considered, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, drugs that do interfere with the action of patrolosant would be excluded. Um, but antidepressants, low-dose antidepressants are allowed. And certainly in the open label extension after the three-week titration and the eight-week double blind, um, the restrictions on, on uh, concomitant medications are, are, much, are, are lessened greatly. So great question, um, certainly one that would be considered in the screening, but the fact that one is on an antidepressant does not in and of itself exclude anyone from participating. Okay, great. And if you have any more specific questions to that, um, you know, really specific to you, please do email clinicaltrials at harmonybiosciences.com. Um, uh, another question, Bill, that came in asks, when does the application process start? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by the application process. Our, our sites are, are already started up, not all of them. We have started up some of the sites um, we are continuing to. As a matter of fact, I'm going to start up a site uh, in Florida tomorrow. Um, so what I would suggest is send your inquiries to the email address that Kelly has provided. I can guarantee you uh, a response in fairly short time. We will address the specifics. If you tell us where you are, we will tell you where the closest site is, how to contact them. 
Um, you can also go, I didn't mention this, but there is a website called clinicaltrials.gov, which lists um, our study, um, has all the information on it and includes um, the list of the sites that are actually open and opening. But I, I think the easiest way to find out is simply to email um, the clinical trials website that Kelly has provided, and we will let you know where the closest sites are, provide you with the contact information, and you can get in touch with the site directly. Great. That's, that's perfect, Bill. And we um, will, when this recording comes out, as Bill mentioned, we will have the infographic on there that will give you a glimpse into the general cities and states and countries where we'll be having um, trials, um, trial sites. And as Bill said, if you're not located directly there, we'd still encourage you to reach out um, to that email address with the, um, the concierge travel service that we have, um, we're happy to help get you to a site that's close to you if, if you are interested in participating. So um, we are right at time. Um, and I think we have answered all of the questions that we can today. Um, so thank you everyone again. Um, thank you for, for calling in. Um, and asking all of your questions and listening. And we're looking forward to engaging with the myotonic dystrophy community um, next year and beyond. So I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.